I'll be home um, in a few minutes. Scott, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Frost to chair this meeting. We've kind of uh, taken it where we rotate back and forth, and the last one was uh, Chair Major did. So if that's okay with you, we'll have Chris chair this meeting. I'm good. Are you up for that, Chris? Thank you. I am. I am up for that. We have everyone here. I'm still checking. Hold on. You guys all came in at the same time, so. Oh, there you. Hey, Chris, Josh, Joe. Hi, Tom, don't know you. You're muted, I believe, Tom. Hello. He's there you are. Hi, Daphne. I, members of the public should be muted. I see Keegan. Brian's there too. Okay, I think I think we have everyone. Hang we on, I, I, I've got to get them all in the system. So it, it's a little, with 10 of you, you're not in any order for me. So if you'll give me a moment, I'd appreciate it. Um, Scott, who's your at large? They don't have one. We don't okay. have an at large. All right, so we basically have 11 then. We would have 11. Right. Okay. But I, um, Brian's there. I see Brian coming in. Joe, hi Joe. Oh, One, oh. Two, three, there's Don. Hi, Don. Who am I missing? Is Micah here? I don't see yeah. Micah. Keegan's here. Okay, Micah's the only yes, one sir. I don't see. Yeah. Don't see you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Keegan. All right. Ron, do you have um, do you have contact information for the public works commissioners? Would you be able to um, contact Micah, send her a text, maybe, and see if she's joining us? I don't have that. No, I'm asking Rob to do that. Oh, Thanks, Scott. Okay, let me get on that. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. You want to give it another minute, Mary? Yeah, if you don't mind, we'll just wait to see if that one last commissioner shows up. Hmm. Okay, we can just, um, if you'd like, go ahead and get started, Chris, and if uh, the commissioner shows up, we'll just mark her in. Okay. Hold on here. All right, 3.34, I'd like to call to order the Public Safety Commission and Public Works Commission joint meeting of May 3rd, 2023. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Commissioners and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to sign up to speak 
on, a particular, on particular items or the tab to watch the meeting. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you sign up to speak before an item is called and are present in the Zoom meeting. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. Commissioners, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. Probably time to change that dialogue a little bit going forward. We'll be very shortly. Good. All right, roll call, Mary. Thank you. I'll start with the Public Works Commission. But Chair Dietrich? Here. Vice Chair Drummond? Here. Commissioner McClay? John? Commissioner McClay, are you? He was there a minute ago. Yes, he was. OK. Uh, Commissioner Major? Yes. And then Public Safety Commissioner is Chair Frost? Yes, here. Vice Chair Spiegel? Here. Commissioner Anit? Here. Commissioner Gibbs? Here. Commissioner Merrick? Here. You have a quorum noting that uh, Public Works Commissioner Belber Bellsberg is not here. And at the moment, uh, is the other one? Oh, Commissioner McClay. Has he arrived? He's okay, here. We'll note. He was here. And, and he was Mike. here, but he's. Don, are you there? We also got. We also got Brent here from from. Uh, oh, Public and Safety. I see Commissioner Bellsberg is here. Yep. Hi guys. But did we yeah. lose Commissioner McClay? Apparently. Okay. I'll reach out to him. Okay, he might have just had some trouble, but you do have a quorum. I also want to note that uh, Public Safety Commission ex officio member Brent Woodworth is here. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Travis, you want to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Travis is gone. Uh, do I have a uh, volunteer? I see Travis there. Yeah, but he's not. I mean, there he is. Yes, sir. All right, please rise. This right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Travis. Um, I'm looking for somebody to approve the agenda. I move we approve. Um, I just have a question about the agenda. I, I know we, we hardly ever meet as a group together like two times a year. And I had heard that special meetings don't do public comment, but it, can we ever do public comment during a joint public safety yeah. works meeting? It is not, it's not customary to have general public comment at a special meeting. We also don't have staff comments and commissioner comments that there's, it's the, the meeting is called specific, for a specific item or items and that's all that goes on the agenda all right did did somebody somebody started to approve the agenda i got yeah, dietrich great. made the motion and josh spiegel will second all right great you want to run right. that around the horn there mary i will do that hold on one moment okay uh commissioner dietrich yes commissioner spiegel yes Commissioner Anit? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Merrick? Yes. Chair Frost? Yes. Commissioner Drummond, or Vice Chair Drummond, excuse me. Can I say no? <laughs> I, I'm just you, gonna- You can. Okay, no. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Major? That's McClay, it's me, and it's a yes. No, wait, Major. Oh, Wade, McClay. can you hear us? Oh, he just went away. He's there. Wade, unmute, if you can do that without No, he, he disappeared. Sorry, you know. Sorry. Went, through, went through that bad uh, PCH patch by La Costa. Uh, yes. And I see Commissioner McClay has joined us. Commissioner yes. McClay? 
Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, approval to, uh, excuse me, yeah, approval to approve the consent calendar. Kind excuse me, can I report on, wait, can I report yeah, on report the posting of the agenda first? I'm Thank sorry, you. go ahead. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on April 27th, 2023. Great. I'll make the motion to approve the consent calendar. Can I get a second? Yes. Scott, Scott Beach, second. Thank you. Uh, Chair Frost? Yes. Chair Dietrich? Yes. Commissioner Major? Yes. Commissioner McClay? Yes. Vice Chair Drummond? Joe, are you there? Yes, sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Spiegel? Yes. Commissioner Neat? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Keegan? Yes, sorry. I don't know okay. sure why it wasn't working, sorry. Okay, Commissioner Merrick? Yes. Motion carries. All right. So we're gonna move to 2A, which is the outdoor warning sirens project. And um, I'm gonna turn to, well, actually, wait a second here. I have- That's not right. Yeah, I have 1B on here first. No. No, 1B, is that was part of the- Yeah, uh, that's right. Then I calendar. Have all right. 2A, so, um, you're correct. Okay, so I have Rob's name on here. Are you doing this, Travis? No, we're having Nadia do. She's gonna. She's gonna help. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, so my name is Nadia Fahum. I am the assistant civil engineer with the Public Works Department, and today I will be providing you with a project update for agenda item 2A, the outdoor warning sirens. I'd like to mention that we have our design consultant here with us today to provide you with a presentation, but before we begin the presentation, I'd like to um, give you some project background for the outdoor warning sirens. In the aftermath of the Woolsey fire, the city pursued um, funding for emergency preparedness, which included improvements to our emergency communications. The city was awarded funding through FEMA for the design of an outdoor warning siren system. In 2019, the city contracted mission critical partners to conduct a siren study to determine the feasibility of sirens. And it was found that a siren system is primarily an outdoor warning designed to alert the public. Indoor notification isn't guaranteed um, and should be used with other forms of technology. So the, the outdoor warning sirens it's not the sole source of emergency communication, but just one tool to be used in conjunction with, with others. Once the study was completed by Mission Critical Partners, it was presented to the Public Safety Commission on August 5th, 2020. The commission made the recommendation to bring back an item with alternatives in place of the sirens. After receiving that recommendation, it then went to council in November of 2020, and council directed staff to move forward with the design of sirens. After receiving direction from council, the city issued a request for qualifications for engineering design services related to this project, and the city entered into an agreement with um, Acoustic Technologies, Inc. in 2021. This last year, 2022, a preliminary design um, was presented to the city and the Outdoor Warning Sirens Steering Committee was formed to provide support uh, and oversight to this project. The preliminary design was presented to the steering committee and based upon the input we received from the steering committee, we have for you today four different design alternatives 
Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce our design consultant, uh, Tom Hinchliffe from Acoustic Technologies. And um, following the uh, presentation, we have Rob Dubo who will provide some final remarks. So go ahead, Tom. Hi, um, I'm Tom Hinchliffe from uh, ATI Systems Acoustic Technologies in Boston. Um, and we have a short presentation about <clears throat> the, the latest um, on the um, siren system. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, we can go ahead with the, uh, can, can I control the presentation here? Okay, you've got that. All right. So um, we have, um, the, the latest is a, a pilot program um, with eight locations um, using um, uh, portable sirens, uh, which um, with the steering committee, we, we discussed this as an option um, to, you know, um, demonstrate the the system. Uh, we we have a, a full proposed system um, that we'll get to later. Um, you know, ne next slide. Um, and this is just a little bit about um, sound propagation. We generally, if there's an emergency, you want to be ten decibels over, you know, the ambient noise. And generally, in um, in a residential area. The, the ambient noise is about uh, 60 dB. Traffic can be a little louder. Um, we, we like to get a, a good strong 70 decibel tone and, um, and higher than that uh, 80 decibel voice uh, to, to get messages across and get people's attention. Uh, just just uh, some background on acoustics. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, so we, uh, I'm going from, uh, North to south, um, we have a um, so the original study um, we recommended 32 locations, and we provided the steering committee uh, with permanent siren options and, and mock-ups. Um, these are the um, eight pilot locations that were chosen uh, based on um, fire history, um, in, in um, popularity of use, and um, areas that may have had um, communication issues in the past um, that, we, that the steering committee thought the sirens might be important. Um, so Trancas Canyon Park is, is one of them. And um, this is the uh, portable sirens acoustics. Um, the shaded areas are um, 80 decibels, 70 decibels, 60 decibels. It gets quieter as you go out. Um, and all the graphics will, will look similar. Um, and this, instead of putting a permanent siren with uh, power and, and poles, the, the pilot program is to, to get a portable siren. You can see the trailer here in this picture to the location. Um, the permitting is a little bit easier for that, just to demonstrate the system and, and what it would sound like, how it could be used. Um, and these trailers can be driven to each site. Um, you can get... Um, you know, start off with one or two or, or, um, and just kind of bring it to each site to do a test. Um, next slide, please. The, these uh, first slides are just um, kind of the locations that were chosen um, as, as a, a pilot um, and not final. There were 32 locations proposed in total for the permanent system, but these are the eight uh, subset of those for the pilot system. This is, um, the uh, Zuma Beach area, um, and this is a, there's a mock-up of of putting putting one of the trailers in the, in the parking lot there. Um, and, and next slide, please. Um, in Point Point Doom, there's another um, area, and, and these these areas are we we tried to get on on public lands as best we can um, for the permanent locations as well. Uh, so. And I tried to put the mock-up uh, to scale with the picture. We we had a technician go out and visit all 32 sites. So these are his pictures from, from that part of the study that I, I put in the, uh, the trailer picture. Um, next slide, please. Um, Paradise Cove was another was another location. Um, again, this is just a, a try to try to give you an idea of what it would look like with a trailer. I tried to scale it to the picture. Um, oh. I, I apologize if it's not perfect. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, the other one was the uh, Harbor Vista Drive. Um, so uh, one of the locations was was City City Hall, and uh, two areas that were 
um, considered important were Har Harvard, Harvard Easter Drive behind in a civic center area. So, you know, putting putting the the the, the uh, trailer in the city parking lot uh, might might be a good idea to to catch both of those areas um, in in a pilot program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and Carbon Mesa Road was was another one. Um, this is at the end of the the beach access. Um, you know, uh, it, it just shows it you know parked there um, as a as a as a test uh, a, car, a pilot program. Uh, next slide, please. And um, the Big Rock Canyon was was um, was one of the first areas chosen as as an important area. Um, and there we have two permanent locations that were proposed in our original study here. Um, so I'm I'm showing what a trailer would look like at both of those. Um, you just want to get get this area. Um, and if you if you did get two trailers for the pilot, you could you could use both of them at the same time to do a test. Um, and the next slide, please. One one's a little further up, and then one's a little bit closer to the to the, the Pacific Coast Highway. Um, so uh, the original study had had two in the Big Rock area. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned a little bit, the, the pilot areas were chosen and they're, they're popular areas. They're areas that were prone to fire, um, areas where notification has been problematic in the past. Um, and there may be some other um, reasons as well uh, the, the steering committee um, might be able to add to. Um, next slide, please. So this is what the trailer would look like. Um, so the, they they are collapsible. Um, it gets fully extended to about thirty feet. Um, you know, typically our, our permanent pole installations are are um, higher than that. Um, they they can be as low as thirty feet. Um, our our pilot um, these trailers that are are proposed for the pilot um, are a little um, less loud than the permanent system would be, but they would be a good demonstration of what the system would be capable of. Um, they can be directly activated at the trailer. Um, there's an activation uh, module in the cabinet on the trailer. You can also get a portable um, uh, control unit that you could activate via a radio signal. Um, and that would be a, a little bit more involved because you have to make sure there's a radio signal um, available for that. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows a little bit more about that. Um, so we do have a, a Pelican case uh, controller that can be used and that's portable. It can go into a police car, a public safety vehicle, um, anything like that. Um, and again, the trailers can be hooked up to a pickup truck and uh, um, put wherever they need to be um, you know, semi-permanently or they can be rolled back into a storage area. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the pilot logistics, um, you could either purchase or rent uh, one to four trailers to place at these locations. Um, there's a temporary permanent process, permit process. Um, I believe the permits are for, for a two week period. Um, so it, it would be pretty easy to test all of these within two weeks. Um, you could probably do it all on the same day or over a couple of days. Um, the idea was to inform the community and stakeholders of tests so they could come um, hear the sirens or, or listen for them. Um, you drive the, the trailer to each site, perform the tests. Again, the, the, the test could be uh, done over a few days, you know, two, two to four tests a day. Um, you can do an activation um, just to kind of demonstrate um, how, how well it works. Um, if, if people are, um, can kind of see what would, what the, what, what it would be like to have um, a siren go off to, to warn of an event. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are, I, I can share a link. Um, we have our, our uh, GSA schedule pricing uh, that we use for government. These are some um, uh, screenshots from that. Um, these are just the, the costs of a trailer. You know, rental would actually be, you know, a, a percentage of that. Um, you do not need a, a controller. Um, you can, like I said, you can activate it directly. Um, and we also, you know, would offer, you know, someone to come out and help you set it up for, for the test to, um, and, you know, our, our rates there. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, and then I'll, um, as um, Nadia had mentioned, and I mentioned earlier, 
um, this was the um, the latest of the the, the permanent study, um, which you know we uh, we would recommend to you know use in, as a permanent warning system. Um, these are the 32 locations. Um, you know, it's a little zoomed out, but just to give you an idea. Um, next slide, please. And um, these are uh, what permanent installations look like, and some of our our, our clients uh, around the world. Um, we can put them on poles. Uh, we can put them on buildings. Uh, put them on roofs, things like that. Um, uh, po poles are usually the the easiest and best for sound propagation, but you know we can. There are other options. Um, so I just wanted to show you those. Um, you know the we the permanent study um, proposes the HPSS thirty two, which is the the double stack, which is the center picture on the top. Um, so that that's what a, a a typical pole would look like for a permanent installation. Um, and if you chose to put it on a roof, uh, a roof, um, the one below that would be kind of the uh, what that would look like. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for a permanent system, um, the communication and activation is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we would typically have software in our central control um, station uh, that you can activate zones, different areas, different neighborhoods. Um, you can activate it through through the web. Uh, typically, we'd have a CCU at either a police station or fire station or something like that, um, uh, some sort of public safety uh, building. Um, sometimes at City Hall, um, and typically we communicate via radio to all of the sirens. So there would be 32 of them. You'd send out the signal from the central control unit to set them off or to set a subset off. And with the topography, you would typically need a repeater to get that signal. Um, and the, you know, that, that's one of the um, more complicated parts of a permanent system. And also there are, there are other ways um, you know, if, if you have an IP drop at each pole, which can be pretty expensive, you can communicate that way. Um, we have, uh, we can also use cell phones um, and uh, satellite modems as well, which, you know, there, there are various expenses with those. But just to give you an idea of um, another piece of the permanent system would be the communication. For the pilot program, um, the trailers can be activated directly at the trailer or with that Pelican case controller. Um, next slide, please. And here are just some costs of some of the components of the permanent system. Um, uh, there, again, this wouldn't include installation, which can which can be um, a little bit uh, more pricey sometimes, depending on the installation method of you know putting in a pole or putting it on a roof. Um, the the cost can vary, um, and then you know this doesn't include the cost of the communication uh, infrastructure which which is uh, what i had mentioned before but just to give you some ideas um, i can share a link um, to our to our pricing page um, uh, later if, if if you want and uh, next slide please um, and these are just some of our um, some of our certifications and awards um, that we've gotten uh, recently. Uh, we are ISO 901 certified, which is, you know, for, for manufacturing there, we follow all their protocols. And um, next slide, please. And that, that was all, it was a, 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 just a pretty short presentation on, you know, the, the permanent system that was proposed and this pilot program to kind of show the capabilities um, as, as a way to, to get started. Um, so that's, I guess I'll turn it back to uh, Nadia for now. Actually, um, actually to me. Oh, to you, sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, uh, yes. So uh, just in, in closing, commissioners, a, a couple of things that I want to point out. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, we had a steering committee actually look into different options and, and things, make recommendations. Um, we went over the, the the different permanent locations and the the size of the poles. I think the size of the poles originally was 50 foot poles, and there was 32. Uh, we actually can go down to 32 or 30 foot poles, uh, um, but still having 32 um, poles throughout the city. Um, the steering committee did thought it, it may be a good idea 
to do a pilot program to kind of see how they would work. Um, that was their recommendation, and, and that's what part of the presentation was um, doing those doing those uh, um, pilot programs. But uh, purpose of this of this meeting is to get both commissions input on the entire project to see what uh, what what they would recommend. And what we're seeking is some recommendation that we want to move forward with council. Uh, the commission will kind of adjust or to discuss the project, um, come up with different alternatives or, or see if these alternatives fit within the, um, the needs of the community. But once the commission has come up with the recommendation, uh, I, I will pass that on to council and we can get further direction. So just to go over some of the different options where we're, where we're talking about this in the staff report, first one was um, do a pilot program, uh, um, have these temporary trailers go out and actually um, per, you know, perform these tests and see what happens, get some input from the community, see if it's something that wants to be done. Uh, the other one is to move forward with the permanent installation, uh, go ahead and with the forward design, uh, in installing the, um, uh, the, the poles, um, a, a, as mentioned, I think there was 32 of them and um, between 30 and 50 feet. Um, uh, also, one of the other options is to do a phased approach, to do some of them now and then come back and do some other one later. Um, and then lastly, one, the last one alternative we came up with is to, to um, maybe abandon the, pro the sound project and look at some different alternatives for um, alerting the systems from within the city. So kind of with that, um, I will leave it to the commission and uh, staff and our consultants available for questions. Don? <clears throat> Um, Excuse me. We, we before we before we take the oh, comments, public. we do have we have one speaker. Actually, we have two speakers. Excuse me. Um, the first is Ryan, and the second is Matthew Strabe. So, Ryan, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've I've not ever conversed with Tom, but I I want to thank him for this work and proposal. Um, and I share my background is in 1992, uh, the year after the city was incorporated, I served on the city's public safety committee for seven years before it became a public safety commission in 1999, where I served another seven years. So we've discussed various warning systems in the past. And I wanted to say for the record um, that my email should be forwarded to Tom that I sent earlier today and that a prior council member, John Seibert, identified many years ago that any public mass warning system would have to have the ability to uh, have more than a tone or a siren that must be able, capable of the human voice to give specific um, notifications for various disasters, such as don't go to Zuma Beach if there's a tsunami. And so that we're not misinterpreting a signal by the 16 million annual visitors that come to Malibu that will not have a guidebook on what the various tones mean. So that was one. The second is in this industry, uh, marine grade components are typically an a, a upgrade in every catalog for hardware. And for instance, Viking Electronics offers almost every item in a fully silicone encapsulated circuit board to keep the salt air off of all of the soldered connections, for instance. It's called enhanced weather protection. Now, I, I'm not sure if the prefab trailers um, have that type of upgrade in, in them, and it would be very important to note for our salt air environment. The third is the location that also should be considered, should be publicly owned lands of the city hall to prevent tampering and monitoring and manual um, uploading of information and not uh, subordinate to some internet or airwave uh, remote coordination. So at least they could be programmed at City Hall and dragged out to Bluffs Park or onto the end of Malibu Pier. Uh, Malibu Pier should possibly be considered a location. And Bluffs Park is the city's official evacuation site for administration if City Hall is damaged or destroyed. Um, 
the quote, changeable message signs when that technology became available for traffic warnings uh, is somewhat similar to this in that you have to update them and change. And so if the data is batched into these devices in advance, what happens when they're all going off at the same time? Do you have like a a delayed or an echo, or what if you're standing in between two locations? What do you hear? So also the capital cost for the network and ongoing cost is a major consideration. Ryan, your time is up. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Is there a second speaker in there, Mary? Yes, there is. Matthew Strabe. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Go ahead, Matthew. Matthew, can you unmute? I'm Mary, let's... I, I'm not seeing, um, Parker? I, I don't see him. Okay, I, I would, this is Daphne and Nate, I would request that we grant uh, Mr. Embre another minute to conclude his remarks. He has 14 years of experience in this area and he's taken the time to put together remarks. So I think we should let him finish. I agree. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, thank you. The The conclusion of the remarks was that uh, in the fire alarm industry, the standards requiring verbal instruction have taken hold. And it's very likely that to be eligible for any FEMA grant and so forth, you'd have to comport to all these standards or future standards. And the only future proof standard is the ability to do amplified audio voice as well as replicating sounds of mechanical sirens and tones. And so it, alternate language, um, whether it's Spanish or Korean or, or whatever is native, is very important to this. And the ongoing capital, or ongoing maintenance of any system is a huge deal. And we need a funding structure and source for this. All of the traffic signals and all of the cell sites and anything else that's all spread out throughout Malibu has a history of being subject to the level of um, repair and maintenance in the field locally. And those systems have failed, including Sprint over time and including Caltrans for sensors at the intersections. Ryan, and your time is up again. <laughs> uh, who is the second speaker? Or the second speaker wasn't in the room. Can we he circle back? I. I don't see I don't see him in the meeting. If he's he's not not I don't see his name on the list of attendees. So you All can right, Don, you can go to the Don, you were starting well, yeah, I, I'm obviously you all know new to this commission. And I'm wondering if this if any of the discussions, if there's been any prior discussion about the pros and cons that is that that I might be aware of if if, if there is. I probably would kind of opt out of most of this, but if there hasn't been, it's not just Ryan's comments, but my own thoughts on this, there's several major questions about this, the whole system, in my opinion. So, so that's number one. And number two was if uh, what the relevance is of the document that was forwarded to us today about a completely different system. I assume it might have to do with alternative four, should we choose to go that route? I'm done for the moment. Hands, hands up. Uh, Scott? Okay. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Tom a question and thank you for the presentation. But Don, I would like you to bring up those questions that you have. Um, this has been discussed at, at council going back and forth, but I think that it's worthy for to hear those comments that you have. But uh, for Tom, I do have a question. Compared to, say, the tsunami warnings that one would get along the beach in Hawaii, what is the decibel level there compared to what you're talking about? Um, it, it would be... Uh... We, we would want to to replicate that that level. Um, so typically the the 80 dB would be for voice commands. Um, it, it'll be a little bit louder close to that. but typically you know our, our systems will 
we want to get full 80 to 70 dB coverage for the entire city for 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 the permanent system, and and that's what's a typical tsunami warning system would would be doing. Okay. Um, yeah, I I'll reserve my comments and opinions, which I have a number of things, but uh, let me turn it over to whoever's next for now. Wade. Unmute. I think both Joshua and Joe were ahead of me. Oh, they were. Okay. Joe? Hi. Um, Tom, I just, those, those um, eight ones that you had in the beginning that you said they collapse low and then they go high, do, are they going to be collapsed until there's an emergency or how do they work? So, so for the pilot program, um, it, it was it was it conceived as a demonstration. So they would be uh, collapsed and brought to the sites for for a period of days, um, and, and raised to do the test, and then collapsed and brought back to a storage area. Um, and then that that's for for the for the test. Um, you know, if if you went with the trailers for a permanent solution, you know, there would have to be you know uh, some discussion on how, how to do that, whether to to leave them there for certain periods of the year, things like that. But but for the pilot program itself, it's just it's just um, a temporary thing for a number of days as a demonstration, if if that helps. So if it's permanent, it would be always up, like, like um, the- for for if if it's a a particular season, um, for for a particular. Um, use yeah uh, yes they would they would be permanently up uh for for uh the purpose of getting out a notification in the event of an emergency and to add to that if i may um the design alternatives two and three that were brought forward the phased permanent installation and the total permanent installation are permanent um 30 to 50 foot sirens that would stay stay up if that answers your question commissioner drummond that's not so good, but okay. Um, and I think the the public speaker that was going to speak was the one who sent the correspondence about the other alert system to cell phones. Is that who that was? It was the cell phones. What are you referring to, Joe? Um, there was an email we were sent today from, I think it was a Michael, somebody about alert FM or something. Did you all see that? That is correct. Yeah, the correspondence but... that we received was from Alert FM, and the gentleman who was signed up to speak but isn't on the meeting, it, okay. it was from him. Okay, thank you. Oh, lost my screen there. Josh? Uh, Josh? Thanks, Chris. Uh, first off, thank you, Tom. Uh, I thought that was oh, a good presentation. Hey, hey, for one second, Matthew Straub is now in here with his hand up. So... Um, let's, Josh, go ahead and speak first, then we'll go to Matthew. No, 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 go, go ahead. Maybe maybe I'll have additional comments. That's fine. All right, Matthew, you want to unmute? There we go. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. I, uh, I had an issue. Anyway, um, yeah, I've got, basically what we did is we distributed some information um, that talked about our system, which fills the gap of delivering alerts, not only uh, outdoor, but also indoor. And we are, um, we are a company that provides emergency alert systems uh, using FM radio infrastructure across the United States. So we've been doing this for about 16 years. We're in 14 states. Currently, we're in, uh, in Shasta County, Butte County. Um, we're also a partner with uh, Shake Alert with uh, USGS. We're the only broadcast-based partner. And we actually, I don't know if I can turn my video on. I wanted to show you. Um, our device um, that we actually deliver. And what makes our system unique is it works when cell, internet, and power are off. So anytime you have a a, a debris flow, uh, fire evacuation, um, we're able to send a message uh, that's targeted to a receiver that sits inside your house that's battery operated and works on works over the FM signals. And we've over the last uh, year and a half, we've been working with the local broadcasters to pilot the system at our own cost because we're rolling out a statewide system in California for all the other counties that need help for uh, an earthquake warning. 
And my, my only point, my only uh, reason we're asking you to consider this is that sirens are going to take a long time to install. And our system is up and running and can, and can operate within before this fire season. And we have we basically have these receivers that have FM radios on them. And they also have um, received text messages that are coming from not only the weather service, um, shake alert, amber alert, um, and also look from your local county sheriff and emergency managers. So, and I and I encourage you to to take a look at this. We're also working with Mission Critical Partners, <clears throat> and we just completed a big project in Kentucky where we delivered fifty thousand of these receivers in less than three months. Um, and so, the advantage of this is that um, you you'll be able to wake wake somebody up in the middle of the in their in their home. They'll be able to get some some directions, even if the TV or the power's off or the cell network's not working, and they'll be able to take this receiver with them and will allow them during evacuation to continue to receive information that's life-saving and also tell them where to go, where not to go, and then also, more importantly, tell them when to come back. And we sent out a bunch of information. We have multiple references, and um, I just encourage you to look at this system also as as a, as a partner with the outdoor warning system and our pricing is very competitive. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matthew. All right, uh, Brian. I'm mute. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to um, disclose that uh, I was on the task force that developed this um, or went through this process. So I've heard this presentation a couple of times now and it was modified. I just want to say that um, Richard Garvey from the, um, what are they called? CERT. Yeah, the CERT. CERT. Yeah, CERT, CERT guy. He's uh, very much in tune and I, I kind of wish he was involved on this uh, call right now so that he, on this meetings, because he has some really valuable information about sort of radio and line of sight and what's worked and what hasn't worked in the past. But basically what the, what the um, task force sort of decided was to sort of, it would probably be best to move forward as a um, sort of a temporary plan and start with a certain amount of them in sort of high density areas like Big Rock, Point Doom, other and Malibu Park, Malibu West areas to try and, um, you know, test this system and see how it worked and do it on a temporary basis because there are some issues such as permitting and other things to do the permanent ones, which would include possibly 50 foot high towers, which obviously nobody's gonna like. So these telescoping mobile ones seem to be the way to go. And I just, um, that that's really where, I mean, a lot of the questions that commissioners are asking are ones that we've already asked in the task force. So um, that's sort of how we ended up where we're at now and why it's sort of a temporary mobile setup was decided might be the best way to go. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Wade and Josh and Scott, I'll have your hands up or are you guys, Wade, do you wanna speak again? Uh, well, I haven't spoken yet, but let, let uh, oh, I'm Josh. Sorry. Josh. Josh hasn't said anything. <laughs> it's all good. Sorry. Thanks, Chris. Um, hey, Tom. Yeah, again, good presentation. I wanted to ask, you know, Brian, I mean, Ryan brought up um, the voice messages, and that was on, the, I think, the first page of the presentation. But um, in that Pelican box, was that um, radio? um receiver that, that that's something that you could pick up and say hey folks hey it's time to move to place a okay gotcha yeah, sure. yeah. um so that's one of my questions um and then we could have if we have let's say could each one of those cases plug into each to, to i mean it's uniform like you can you can plug you could bring that pelican case to any one of the poles in permanent or temporary Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you decided what the total cost per trailer soup to nuts with one of those um, Pelican cases and everything that you'd need to fully operated to fully operate one of these is? Well, 
we, we do a formal proposal when 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 you want all the the nuts and bolts but um the, what i shared earlier the the tr the, the permanent cost of the trailer is, a, is about fifty thousand uh but uh it, the rental would be would be less than that obviously um and, and that that's because of you know it, it is more weatherized and all that um but that's that's about and then the the pelican case is about is about seven um so tom tom can you let the commission know how much like a 30 and 50 foot pole system permanent pole would be so they can get an idea too yes yes so so i have a, um there's a link link to our pricing for all of the things um i i can share that maybe maybe in the chat um so what, is, there, is there a way you can just say what that number is or, or um right? It's it's in the proposal. So the uh, the permanent poles are about twenty thousand, um, but um, that does not include installation, which can vary um, depending on the region. Um, it the installation is usually done by a, a you know electrical contractor. It also um, so that that can um, range from ten to twenty thousand um, as well. And then the the more permanent um, uh, control stations are, are about about ten um they're they're in the, those prices are in the presentation as well um and uh but but again you know with a permanent system you have to factor in the permanent communication system and, and that price can can be you know all over the place depending on you know whether it's cellular whether it's radio uh, things like that um so sort okay. of yeah okay. so okay. so, so the commission... go ahead sorry so the so just doing those numbers we're, we're looking close to about two million right um, yeah, that's kind permanent. of what I ballparked with the permanent stuff on my notes. But um, I'm just thinking if we wanted to buy, like maybe buy one of the trailers or rent a couple of the trailers just for as a pilot program. Um, is 80 decibels the mat? How how far how high can these things crank? Um, well, well, you don't want to go, uh, you know, too loud, <laughs> close to the ground because you don't want to damage people's hearing. But but generally, um, you, they don't they don't get louder. Than about about a hundred at, at ground level, um, you, you know, around there, um, and then you know, eighty is typically, you know, within within the trailer, um, you know, around, um, you know, fifteen hundred feet around is is where we get like the the good eighty decibel intelligible voice, and out to about thirty six hundred feet. Um, this varies a little bit with conditions. Um, you can get a strong tone tone signal, so. Um, the permanent sirens um, that goes out a, a good another 30 40 percent but um, you know for the trailers they're they're a little bit um, the, there's there's four speakers instead of eight so they're they, they don't go quite as far but but you get a good um, range on intelligible voice instructions okay um I guess my other question uh, one more question I, I think it's maybe Rob or maybe Susan have we brought this up to planning at all to see if we could even have a 30 foot pole nope not yet okay. yeah that's that's definitely a concern okay and then ask them if we can or paint coastal orange right? and white also what's that the paint ask them if we can paint it orange and white <laughs> good job um Zing. You know, I, I just wanted to share with the rest of the commissioners you know we have I live in Malibu West. We we do a pretty good job with um, the brigade and wearing a shirt. But um, one of my neighbors actually has a siren. It's a hand crank. It does get it gets pretty loud. I, we, I don't have a decibel meter or anything, but we tested it. I wasn't able to hear it in the bottom of my neighborhood, and we're I don't know three hundred yards away. I wasn't able to hear it at all. Standing outside, clear, calm day in the morning. Um, I'm. I'm skeptical. That being said, I would like to see these in the field. I would like to, you know, at least test it, roll them out and see if these will work because I don't know, maybe it was a directional issue. Maybe it was my hearing. I, I don't know. But um, I'm while I'm skeptical, I do think that Malibu could use one or two of these trailers if, if even if it's not an early warning system. So maybe we try it out. But um Maybe I'll have more questions um, as it goes, but I'd like to hear from everybody else. So it's just just a follow up, Josh, on that too. Are, are you saying that as a permanent um, solution, having temporary trailers, um, sirens be deployable out 
in certain situations? <clears throat> I'm thinking the worst case, if we if we were to buy one or two of these things, we would have them staged. They'd be covered up. They'd be maintained. We'd have them, you know, maybe just parked at City Hall or wherever wherever we stage them. Find find room for them. And in the event of a disaster, we could use these to either roll out, warn people yep. if there's time, or we could use them for, or CERT could use them for uh, communication, mass communication. Yep. Um, it just seems like this is something that we could use. Um, but uh, I, I'm just skeptical in this yeah. kind of early warning format. Is this the solution? Is this part of the solution? Does this fill some gaps or does this, you know, what, what where did we stand? But yeah. I'm definitely not sold on this being, you know, one stop solution here. So let me just kind of follow up on the, the trailer and deploying them out, that takes a lot of work, a lot of resource, a lot of timing to get them out. Um, and realistically, it, it would be very tough to roll something out like this, get things going, if there was an emergency or if there was something that we weren't really prepared to do. Um, if it was deploying them out early, it's they're going to be out early. They're going to be open. They're going to be up and ready to go, like they're permanent. So I, it, I, I'm just trying to. Right. So what, basically what I'm saying is I would like to see these. I mean, I, it's and correct me if I'm wrong. These trailers would be almost as good as a permanent location. Right. We, we raise them up 30 feet in the air. We blast out the, the sirens. We test them to see if they'll work. I would rather test it before we spend two million dollars for 32 of these locations. That doesn't work. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, we could we could fire them up at Zuma. We could fire them up at the Civic Center and and see if if people hear them. I, I was just giving you my my information on, on if a trailer was going to be the permanent solution. As doing the test, yeah, absolutely, a test not a problem, kind of a thing. As doing a trailer as a permanent solution out there, there's some logistics, resource, and timing issues that I, I would see as being really a um, an, an impact or an issue of kind of deploying them uh, in a critical moment. So sure, having, sure. Or we'll just we'll just yeah. hook them up to Chris's car at all times. True. That's that's a good point, right? Yeah. No, like Ten of them in a row, just like a train. Exactly. So no, I, I'm just thinking. You know, I'm definitely not ready to sit here and vote and say, hey, look, let's let's fire up these poles, let's go permit them, and you know, in six to ten years when they get through planning, and uh, we we'll have a good system. Um, but I, I do think that bef we need additional information. We need to see if these things actually work. So let me get, let me just make sure I, I summarize. You're interested in, in seeing the pilot program kind of and seeing how these goes. And then, then from there, make a, make another decision on, you know, what we want to do from here on out. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Wade. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Chris. Um, and I want to thank Tom as well for, for a very, very thorough presentation. I had a lot of questions coming in and that kind of helped really frame my understanding of this. I, I agree with just about everything Josh has said. I, I'm skeptical after kind of seeing all the specifics, but I, I am curious to see just to pilot it in maybe a couple places. I don't think it makes any sense for us to spend any kind of money on this thing unless we know it's going to do what we need it to do and what it's designed to do. Uh, I noticed one of the locations at Big Rock looks like it's really, really close to, to me and to Joe. So I think you'll get two very strong opinions uh, <laughs> after the first test. But um, uh, so just a, a few things. Um, the, uh, I, I think towers uh, into any permanent degree are a non-starter, even if they get through planning. I keep this community is just, we're trying to get rid of towers, we're trying to get rid of poles, we're trying to, you know, we have view sheds and we have, you know, building ordinance. We're trying to get everything lower. And we're trying to, trying to get rid of eyesores that interfere with views. And I, I don't think anything that sits on a 50 foot pole is, is going to go anywhere. I think people are going to want alternatives. I'd be curious to know first, Brian, when you were on the task force, did did you guys hear any uh, like what Matthew Straub, uh, uh, Strabe, I'm sorry, uh, presented? Did you consider any alternative systems like that that are perhaps more quickly installed or do different things? Were there alternatives uh, uh, talked about? 
Uh, no, no alternatives other than what um, Tom's company was offering. Uh, so no, not here. Their other company uh, fee such. It is it, I mean, I, I'm just wondering if it's worth um, having technology changes, you know, every every day now. So I'm just wondering if it's worth maybe revisiting some some possible alternatives that are that would be less impactful on the environment, less impactful on view sheds. Um, I don't know. That's just a thought. I'm, I'm just putting it out there kind of rhetorically. Um, I'm also curious as to whether or not um, the, does, have we run any numbers on staffing and maintenance, what Ryan talked about? What, what would this cost to, let's say, we, let's say we put the full permanent system in, just theoretically. We put these, I guess, 32 locations or whatever it is. Every year, that's going to require how many people and how much money to make sure that they're, they're operating. Do we know? Do we have a ballpark? I don't even know who'd answer that, but Rob, I'd, I'd say probably not. How can you possibly? Oh, wait, uh, say it again. I have to guess. I, I, have to I'm guess just, well, I, I'm just wondering. I mean, obviously, the, there, there's some level of maintenance. Ryan brought this up. There is a level of maintenance required to keep this stuff working. So let's say we install theoretically the whole 32 or however many system. That's going to require to make sure that when we get around to fire season or whenever, that you know they're all working perfectly. Do we have any sense of what the maintenance regime would be to keep all of that functioning every year? So it's a great question. I, I, I would assume that there there is a um, a recommended um, maintenance and an operation kind of procedure that they probably want, <clears throat> um, and, and then Tom probably can kind of fill us in more. But they, they probably want this the siren and the system to use every every so often to kind of look at it, make sure it's working properly. Um, uh, but also too, it, it's one thing that Ryan did mention too, is that, yeah, we're in a salt environment. We put anything steel up in the, in, in, uh, um, in the air. If it's, even if it's galvanized, eventually it's going to start corroding and, and need to be replaced. And so, yeah, it's some of this equipment will probably need replacing. I, I, I don't know that, the duration of it, it, it could be um, three years, it can be five years, it can be seven years. For example, uh, we have those uh, um, changeable message signs trailers that we use a lot. Those, uh, they're uh, they're all metal, they're painted, they're coated and everything else. They still get just destroyed by the 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 ocean atmosphere over here and, and have to be replaced and repaired. and. Um, Currently, right now, we're in the process of looking to kind of replace all all the ones we have. So, um, yeah. So there could be a, a lot of maintenance with these. Okay. I mean, I, I I'd, I'd just be curious as to what kind of a number we're looking at because if the whole system has to be replaced every five or seven years and it costs two million dollars, that's a that's a high price tag to for something that you know we call it permanent, but it sounds like it's disposable at that point. Um, I, I think the pole. Would be probably okay it's the equipment on the pole that may need to be replaced based on how it's reacting to uh, uh the ocean environment so maybe the speakers would so it's not the entire price of the pole of 20 20k but it could be um a, a fraction of that for okay uh, so and then my kind of my last big question and i'll have a couple of just closing notes but uh, you know whatever system we decide on part of one of the reservations I have with this is that, well, we're going to, when fire season comes around, we're going to buy these things. We're going to roll them out. Well, okay. But fire season is year round. So, you know, yes, it's, it, it tends to be September through, you know, through November. That's kind of the, you know, October and November in particular, that's the, when it really usually hits like, it's like 95% of our fires come in, but we've had fires in December. We've had fires in January. We've had occasional fires in July. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think, and we live in a different world now. We don't know if there's going to be a, you know, a chemical spill or an oil spill that's going to, you know, out at, at sea, or if there's a chemical attack or, you know, there are all kinds of other emergencies that if you're investing in a system like this, you want it to be able to cover all of that. And um, 
so it, ha it would have to be a year round thing. So I don't know that a temporary system where we wheel out these things, you know, just when we think we're going to need an emergency, that's kind of counterintuitive to the whole idea of an emergency system. An emergency system warns you about the things you don't expect to come. That's the whole point of it. And I'm concerned that if we're, you know, going to save money and we're going to address a lot of these other concerns by going mobile, that we're sort of missing a big chunk of what emergencies are all about. So that's a concern. Um, and then I, I'm just, you know, the, the last two things is I, I really think that we should explore alternatives because Josh said, you know, this goes to planning. It's going to be six, seven, eight years. Who knows how long it'll be. Uh, if we, if it's an emergency system and if the technology is there for something that, that is, you know, not an eyesore and that we can do something that's a little more agile and technology, you know, that's high tech that we can implement that faster and sooner and with le uh, less of a, a kind of an administrative headache, I think it's worth considering. So it might be worth kind of, you know, going back and just not going back to the drawing board, but maybe looking and seeing if there are alternatives that have emerged in the meantime. And then also, um, you know, is a partial system off the table because there really are, I, I don't know that we need to blanket the entire community. Uh, if if we're really going to do this, I think there are certain areas that are more isolated than others that are more urgent than others. So maybe if it comes if push comes to shove, a partial system can be considered. Just putting it out there. But regardless, I think anything that that is is an eyesore, anything that's too high, that's too ugly, uh, that just kind of contravenes everything that you know is we're trying to do generally in Malibu, uh, I, I think is a non-starter. That's it. I'm done. Thank you, Wade. I think what you were talking about is all risk, a system that covers all risk, all risks, so to speak. But and for my two cents, I don't think these polls would ever get approved personally. That's just my two cents. But um, I, Scott, I think you were next in this. I am. Rotation. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Chris. And yeah. And, and thank you, Wade and Josh, because I agree with both of you. I am. I would like to uh, go with uh, solution four, which is do nothing. <laughs> I base that Not do nothing. on uh, the fact that I think our main danger, of course, is fire. We have these others, but just tsunami, I don't think is a big danger to us, given the lay of our coastline and where tsunamis are likely to hit up in Alaska, we could have a residual, but it doesn't look like that's a huge danger for us. Some of the other things that Wade mentioned are possible, but we know we run a risk of fire every time we get a Santa Ana. This system, and with all due respect to Tom, and I think your presentation was great, this system is for exterior. It's to warn people outside. And if you're gonna warn somebody about a fire, because we do have our telephone system that works on both landlines and cell phones and emails, and that seems to work very well. Remember, you know, getting like 10 calls at one time um, to warn you uh, about stuff. But this system being for exterior only, we have a fantastic warning for anybody in the path of a fire already. It's called smoke. If you happen to be outside, as I was in the 93 fire, um, look up, see a cloud. I knew just when that fire started in old Topanga. We have a, an existing warning system for those inside, and this is will not work for inside. It also, because I was at the council meeting when it was discussed, and yeah, in certain canyons, in certain places, as uh, you know, Josh mentioned, he was he's not hearing the siren. So I, I really don't think it's viable for us. And at a cost to make it effective, you're going to need permanent poles. And you know, Chris, you said it. Thirty-two poles is a non-starter. It's not going to go anywhere at all um i mean in other places you could put sirens on top of buildings put them on top of city hall that would work but again 
uh, you know, if there's a fire coming, you know, in Woolsey, as a perfect example, we look at people who died. Why did they die? Because they waited to the last minute and then drove through smoke and got lost and their car got stuck. It wasn't that people got trapped in their house, which was actually probably a very safe place to be. So I, I think this is a solution that could be beneficial, but it's not worth the cost to the environment, let alone the money. And I don't think it'll be very effective. If you wanted to have a pilot program, my last point, if you wanted to have a pilot, rent one trailer and move it around every hour in Malibu to a different location and you get to hear it. Um, you only need to rent one. You don't need to let it sit there. You just say, okay, on Saturday the 30th, we're going to have a test and you let everybody know. So uh, unless I hear some really strong argument. I don't think we need this for exterior only. We do a good job interior. I would spend the money on fuel modification. Uh, hire some goats. Who wants to be a goat herder? So, so Scott, if I get you right, what you're talking about is, is sort of a alternative one with a twist, basically. No, I'm talking about alternative four, which I believe is we don't do anything with these things well, you, at all. you were saying move one around i kind of like that idea so i want to well okay i if i remember right alternative four well okay if you were going to do a pilot program which i i don't even know if i support that i i think uh, from what i've heard this this only helps exterior and i don't think that's our problem but if you want to have a pilot program if that's what Everybody decides, just get one trailer and move it around that day, yeah. All right. Uh, Susan, you've had your hand up for a while since you're head of this department or one of these two departments. You want to – let's let her speak before we keep going through here. Sure. Thanks. I, I just want to address the, quest, the question that Wayne Majors uh, asked regarding – alternative systems and the one that Matthew Straw brought up. I just wanted to let you know that we are actually working on having the infrastructure in place to be able to have that as an option. I'm working with uh, KBU right now. The one um, issue with KBU at the current moment is that his signal doesn't reach all of Malibu. So we're working to get a repeater in place so that about 99% of Malibu could be reached. And then it would be a functional state station for an FM alert type system. So we are working on that. Susan, is that the repeater that would go at Bluffs? Yes. Okay. And is there a timetable on that? Um, first, I'm taking an MO. I'm working on an MOU with him right now to take to the council just to make sure that the city is on board with doing this because at that point, It'll be like a public-private partnership because if they approve, then I'm going to spearhead the installation of a pole at Bluffs Park and take on that part of the project. Is there any, are there any, the, and I've, I've talked to Hans about that, which I mm -hmm. think is a great idea. My only, my only question, and I don't know the answer to this, is that his current antenna is outside city limits on county land and the repeater would be on city land. Does that create any kind of regulatory or legal issue that you know? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah I, I, I talked to Hans too. I don't. I don't think there is any. There's any issue that way. He was talking to me about his FCC license and stuff. And he was getting real technical and he was getting excited. But I, I, I don't <laughs> think it's going to be an issue with his license or and whatnot. Great. Wait, Wade, were you talking about his antenna on Winding Way? Uh, where, wherever it is, wherever his main yeah. antenna. I think the winding way, right. the very top by the yeah. water tank. All right, I think that Daphne, you had your hand up for a while, and I think you're next. Can you unmute, please? There, there, there we go. go. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, just before I ask my questions, just looking at the proposal from Tom, it is my understanding that your system does have voice uh, signals in addition to siren, correct? Yes. 
Okay. So just to get that issue off the table, I'm looking at your, your specs, I saw a voice there. Okay. Um, just from what I'm hearing from all my fellow commissioners, um, I think sort of one of the big issues that comes to mind for me is that we are being asked to look at this particular system um, sort of outside the whole underlying process that got us to the point where we were looking at a warning system. Uh, and one of the comments that was made earlier, I guess, by Scott that, you know, we're only concerned about fire. That's our main uh, issue. And, um, you know, this particular system is an outdoor protecting people who are outdoors, not indoors. And I guess I would say that, yes, we have a fire hazard, obviously living in Malibu, but that's not the only hazard we have. Uh, we have earthquake threat. We have flooding threats. We have land subsidence threats. Um, you know, there's lots of different threats that we face and with global warming and climate change, those other threats in addition to fire will increase. So I think part of the problem here is we're not all, we haven't started off on the same page as to, you know, what are our risks and who are we trying to protect? Because if we're talking about not wanting to have an eyesore, but giving up on an eyesore is going to not save lives for people that are outdoors, maybe we'll be having a different conversation. Um, so for me, I'd like to have more of a discussion about what our risks are and what we're focused on trying to mitigate. I think that would help a lot in terms of making decisions about uh, you know, where the money is going to be spent. But I don't agree that um, the, the, the concern of an eyesore should be the motivating factor in deciding whether or not we should implement potentially life-saving warning systems. Um, and if we're focused on what kinds of risks we have and the, and the people that we're trying to protect, then I think our conversation can be a little bit more sensitive than people worrying about their view. Um, in terms of what we do with this particular project, um, you know, a lot of time and effort went into it. So none of us other than Brian <laughs> were apparently part of that. Um, I'm not 100% clear on what the cost is associated with the pilot. Um, but like I said, I think having a clear picture on what our risks are and who we're trying to protect and what our options are, are really key issues we need to have further discussion on um, as part of the process. Thank you, Daphne. Can I, can I also point something out? And your points are well taken. It's, it's, we're in an all risk area and uh, we do have the threat of I mean, is it a huge threat for a tsunami? No, but if one ever does get between the islands, it's gonna be pretty nasty if it actually does. So that being said, also we're, you know, we get into this, this budget and cost analysis on certain things. And then I end up getting told by the city manager that we're not budget. <laughs> so that while, while, yeah, it's on the back of our minds because it, it is our city and our money and whatever, um, that budget is really kind of left up to the people in the city and in public works or whatever. We get to see what it is, obviously, and it does make a difference, but it, um, it's, we're not supposed to really be basing stuff on budget. So um, that being said, I have a, a bunch of, uh, of hands here. I think it's either Micah or Joe who's next. Which one is it? Micah? Good morning. Go ahead and unmute if you. Sorry there about you that. Joe, Joe, do you want to go? Oh, you can go first. I'm fine. I, you know, most of the other comments have really covered uh, some of my questions. I appreciate Tom your presentation. <clears throat> I think that this doesn't seem to me like a, a blanket solution for Malibu. Um, and, and one of my questions was, do you hear it in your house, and what's the proximity? Because if if you don't hear it in your house then we're really talking about areas that are, you know, parks and areas that people are hiking and outside. And, and maybe this is a good solution for those areas only. Uh, because in those areas, you usually don't have your cell phone or a warning system. Uh, I agree with Daphne that I think that, you know, safety is probably more important than the look of stuff. However, 
the issue with that is that when people start fighting about the look of stuff, it just takes time to install it and to get approval. And so that it, things can get buried with people complaining and writing letters and stuff like that. So that's one of the issues I see in areas that, you know, somebody would feel upset with it interfering in their life. The other problem that I had was that I see with this is it is a big cost. And if I understand this correctly, I don't think there's any kind of insurance policy for something like this. And, and so does this go through a fire or are, are all your systems destroyed, you know, or all the ones that are, it's in that fire zone, your, your, all the infrastructure you've purchased is wiped out. So that's, you know, and again, it depends on how much it is. It is important. You know, if you spend $2 million and save a lot of lives, you know, it's, that's obviously important, but at the same token, I think that this is probably not for neighborhoods where people are indoors, that it's not, you know, and, and they're going to burn and, and not have their value. Uh, I'm just looking at what I wrote here. My other question was, had this system, does it have a history of going through disasters and saving lives? Is, you know, is this a, something that, that it's, it's been used and it's, there's a proven strategy here because my concern too, is it's a, it is a costly system. And to say, is it going to work the way that we expect it to for that price? Cause I think there's a lot of unknowns. I think that's it. From most of my other questions were covered by other other great questions that people had. Jill. So I um, instead of the long poles, cannot we consider putting on a, the existing traffic signal poles, which already are interspersed throughout Malibu and operated by the state Caltrans, to save twenty thousand dollars per pole? The traffic signals already have battery backup too. And the flock is going on the Caltrans signal as well. And I'm not sure how much grant money we're getting from FEMA, but if it, it should be higher if it's multi-jurisdictional with state involvement. And then I think combining that with a wireless emergency alert, like we get those amber alerts on our phone, I think local, local government can send those wireless emergency alerts, can't they? We are. There's a lot in one bite, but... <laughs> Just Caltrans poles, that's, that's out of the question. The, the Caltrans will never allow um, that type of load and everything else too. We would have to seriously beef up those signal poles tremendously. And it, it would I'm, it, it would be probably three times as much <laughs> probably per, per pole, probably as, as you mentioned. Yeah, it would be a lot of money because you'd have to rip out the other pole, rip out all the signals, do the new wiring, put, put in a new foundation put a new stronger pole with all that so it's it's a lot of work to even put it on caltrans I, I, it's they have very very strict standards on and procedures on what can go and what uh, what loading everything goes on to signal poles so how is the flock how is the flock system going on those poles then are they is that it's like not well the law enforcement is handling that it has to go through the sheriff's department Okay. They won't do Those it are, with the city. It's not a flock system, Joe. Yeah, and it's but, not flock. <laughs> but, but those are substantially lighter than those speakers. Yeah. It's substantially lighter. So it's right. it's it's taking that consideration. Caltrans looking at that. It's it's the load on for those cameras in that system is very very minimal. Yeah, and I'd also add that the PCH for our high risk areas is not the ideal location for a siren. If you think about wind direction or we're at high risk of a large fire, uh, PCH is not going to help anybody in Big Rock or, you know, up in these canyon areas because they won't, there's no chance they'll hear it. And what about this wireless emergency alerts that we get, like the Amber Alerts? Yeah, we, we have that capability. We're looking for things that don't require internet and cell service being available because that's the problem we're trying to solve for. Oh, so Amber Alerts needs cell service? Like Absolutely. They do right now at this point. Mm -hmm. Don't go, okay. So that's why this whole radio thing then. Okay. Yeah. I think you're, Susan, you're talking about satellite, correct? No. Well, Amber Alerts, all that, it's all over cell. No, no, you're talking about going to a satellite type of system. Or KBU. Yeah. For... For what? For right now, we're looking at radio through KBU, 
Um, I mean, we do have satellite phones and some satellite service, but not for widespread uh, notifications. Right now we're looking at radio systems. All the new iPhones, the new ones have satellite, they have the ability to communicate with satellites. Right. All of them. Yeah. Just, I just okay. want to throw that out there. I'm not saying- Thank, thank you, Josh. Yeah. That's correct. It's a good point. Uh, Keegan? Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Tom, for the presentation. Let's see the second or third one we've seen from public safety. Um, yeah, I mean, most of my comments have already been covered by other people. I agree that a majority of our worry is fire. Um, and I think I don't believe that these will adequately cover fire. I think that also for the most part, uh, tsunami is obviously a, a, a worry. I've looked at the tsunami map. There, it doesn't impact a whole lot of Malibu outside of just immediate, immediate coastlines. And then if a tsunami hit, we're not necessarily losing, we're most likely won't be losing power during tsunami or prior to a tsunami, I should say. And so alert system should be adequately um, robust, right? Um, we saw what happened in Hawaii when they accidentally sent out that Inter intercontinental ballistics missile um, incoming test. Um, so uh, I don't know. The, the, everybody else has kind of covered it. I, I do think that if there's pressure from either this body here or the public or council um, or staff um, to move forward or at least explore it further, I think at minimum or at most at this point, I think we should at least try out one of the trailers, do a public awareness day around it, tug one of those trailers around, rent it and see how it sounds. I think we'd probably get a lot of public input then as well. I think passing this thing or even pushing it too much further without getting public input from people would probably uh, uh, be pretty tough as well. So, and that doesn't even consider all the visual potential impacts, et cetera. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. And um, obviously updating costs in the future, outdating technology. I think the what's coming down the pipe with what Josh just said around satellite technology, specifically with phones, is really interesting for communications, potential communications, what um, is going on with uh, the Starlink stuff, there's a lot of satellite communication stuff that's going to, I think, solve a lot of the communication issues that we're trying to solve with slightly older technology, with radios, et cetera. So, um, anyway, that's my those are my comments for now. Um, yeah. Thank you, Keegan. Brent. Hey, thank thank you very much. I mean, it's an interesting challenge because it is multifactorial. You've got people you're trying to alert externally outside of buildings and businesses and homes, that, that's correct. And then of course the folks that are inside and it really does take two different systems. Um, just to echo something Keegan said, the, the two major risk factors in Malibu are fire and earthquake. Uh, earthquake is where zone four in California. Uh, warning systems on earthquake, the most effective is ShakeCast, which is out there um, as the best way to warn people. Sirens on an earthquake, they're going to go off after the earthquake already hit. So what value is that? Um, so on an earthquake standpoint, you want to try to be preemptive. Um, and that's usually only a few seconds at best if you if you get that. On a tsunami, I know I've done a lot of tsunami studies and so forth. And with Dr. Lucy Jones and others, we're susceptible, but not for a very high tsunami. Maybe three to six feet would be worst case. Um, and again, having a, a warning system that would allow people on the coastal areas and the beaches to be able to go to higher ground, that, that does make some sense to do that. Um, but of course, there's a cost, as we know, in maintaining it and, and using it. For fire, I don't see the real value of um, this kind of system for fire, because you really want to be able to tell people, and it's going to be based on location, how soon will they be affected by the fire and exactly where they should evacuate and when? Um, so there's quite a bit of detail that varies based dramatically on location. 
and the path of the fire, which can change dramatically. Um, I, I am a big fan of what um, Susan's talking about for KBU, uh, trying to use that solution in the alert FM type solutions. The alert FM solution will work without power. Um, so that really makes sense. I know I've been in this situation without power for several days when fires were coming and there was no way to get an alert because cell was down, power was down, landlines were down. Your only solution was, you know, smell the smoke. Uh, that was about it or see what was going on outside you. Um, the, the costs are clearly a factor. The visualization of 50 foot poles and so forth, all a, a big factor, I think, in making these kinds of decisions. Um, I will tell you one other thing as far as warning for, for sirens. They're very effective in the South and the Midwest for tornadoes. We don't have that risk. Uh, so a tornado warning system isn't gonna do a lot of good. Uh, and as I said, it, it's it's good for tsunami, but really mainly on, on the beach area. So there's a lot of trade-offs on costs. And I think it has to be a multi-type of solution to really address the needs of the, of the community itself. And I would rather see us invest in continuing the alert type systems like Alert FM, the KBU system. Uh, I know LA County Fire issued weather alert radios and they need to refine how messaging goes out to the weather alert radios. Um, but it's good that we're talking at least about this. And finally, if you were to pilot it, um, yeah, if you did it with just one particular system that was mobile to go out and see how people reacted, that's fine. Anyone who's got double or triple pane windows in their house isn't gonna hear the siren. Uh, it, it's just it just won't work that way. But if you just want to test it to see how it would work, that might work. Chris, back to you. Thank you. Um, let me see, Scott. Oh, what, who is no Don? Don was before me. Go ahead, Don. Well, I also a lot of what I was going to ask about has been covered, and I want to thank Tom for his presentation. I think his trial, though, I think there's a little misunderstanding. I think he was is planning on the trial to have only one trailer and tr use it, move it to the eight different locations, Roger. So we're talking about a relatively modest cost. We're talking also here about two systems, one for residents and one for visitors, the way I look at it. The one for residents involves things like cell phones and cable and the other internal mechanisms that we could, where we could communicate directly to the people in their homes. The siren system clearly won't work for that and never was intended for that. But we might want to consider something like having one or two of them, as somebody else has suggested, put one on Zuma Beach and leave it there in the event of a disaster, whatever the disaster, it would be useful for, possibly for crowd control, maybe at other high density visitor sites, we might want to do that. Um, and But I think first and foremost, we, get, we need to kind of go back to where this all started and what are our objectives in doing this and doing any of this. And I think that's something that Daphne referred to essentially. Um, do we want to have uh, primarily the, the primary advantage of the KBU system compared to cell phone systems, in my opinion, is that uh, you get instantaneous to all thousand of 10,000 or whatever it is subscribers instantly, whereas cell phones, the, the cell phone capacity of the of the uh, cell phone carriers as such, they could do that if they wanted to. So I think it might be worth following up on the second vendor that showed up today with this email as part of the feasibility that we're kind of exploring here with these two systems, one for visitors and one for residents. That's all I have to say. Um, Don, you brought up something interesting about Zuma Beach, um, you know, they, they clear that beach doing thunderstorms. They clear all the beaches yeah. uh, doing lightning and thunderstorms. So there's part of your all risk type situation. Also, uh, Scott, before we go over to you and to, May, to Wade, Richard Garvey is in the meeting. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So do you want to speak first? Scott? No. Um, uh, Richard, let's turn it over to Richard since he's here. Wade? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, I, I, I want to say I'm so impressed by the people on both these commissions. I, I've changed my mind on things like 14 times just listening. We have so many smart people in the city. I'm, I'm 
really just uh, totally impressed. This is a great meeting. Um, so I, I just, I wanna clarify a couple of things. I'm very much in support of considering a system. I think a system would be great. You know, you, hikers can get caught, people can get caught on beaches. You never know where somebody's gonna need to hear this system. So it's very much, yes, a visitor serving system. I just don't know that this is the system. And I, I've been leaning to Scott's position. I, I, there's a sick, curious part of me that would love to, you know, see this thing trailered around town for a weekend or a week and, and just, you know, see what people think of the siren when it goes off. Um, but uh, the, the, the one thing that I keep coming back to in my head is that, and I think about 93 as well, like Scott, I was there and, you know, there, were, there was no question. You saw that plume of smoke and you knew what was coming. So, but the one, the one thing that was a problem then, there are two problems, Woolsey in 93. So in 93, I remember the police are going around with, they're the ones that are announcing the evacuation orders. They're the ones that are, that are going from neighborhood to neighborhood with their speakers going off. And those are resources that in a fire you want allocated elsewhere. You don't want the sheriff driving neighborhood to neighborhood, telling people to evacuate. It would be preferred to have some other system, not necessarily a siren, could be, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled with Susan said that we're going to be getting, you know, the opportunity to really extend this through, through the, the KBU system. That sounds like something that is much more likely to be effective. But the other problem that we learned in Woolsey was people evacuate and it clogs PCH and it creates another problem. And if that had been a day where we had people on beaches or we had, you know, a, a couple thousand hikers, now you've got an additional problem. Now it becomes critical. Now it's a, it's, you're, you're verging on another disaster, a disaster creating a disaster. So I, I'm wondering, okay, yes, on the one hand, we want to free up resources like the sheriff to not be the ones who have to go and tell people to evacuate. On the other hand, what do we want this system to do? When these sirens go off, what is it? What are we asking? Are we asking the whole city to evacuate? Are we just letting people know? What's the goal? I mean, in principle, we, we've talked about a warning system, but what is it trying to accomplish? What do we want this to do? That's what I'm not quite clear on yet. Rob, you want to? Yeah, I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole point is to try to get people's attention, and you're correct. Um, if it's they're just hearing a siren sound, then people need to be trained to turn to KBU or other some other news source to get information. And yeah, we could have some with a um, you know voice control, but we've been advised that that will have very limited capabilities in terms of how many people will even be able to understand what's being said. So it's not necessarily the answer. Um, but ge generally speaking, the siren is meant to get people's attention, to wake them up, which I don't necessarily believe is going to wake up pretty many people. I'll be totally honest with you. And I think you all kind of feel the same way. Um, but it is to try and get people's attention. And then they have to turn to some other news source to get more information. Okay. Because in my head, I'm thinking well, the, the way that you would naturally go about this is you reverse engineer it. You say, OK, in the event of an emergency, we want to evacuate neighborhoods, get people's attention, get them to turn to the radio, so forth and so on. So what will enable us to do those things? And the way you've described it, I'm that gives that's changed my mind again. So I I if the goal is to get people to turn on to different to turn on the news, I don't think an, uh, a, a siren system is the best way to do that. I think it has advantages for doing other things, but putting sirens on 50 foot poles to urge people to turn on KBU or some other, some other alert system, I think we could do that far more effectively and cost effectively and in a shorter period of time. We are doing it now. Really? Yeah. Cell phones. Right, but we're trying to solve for the problem for one cell service is not available. Agreed. That makes yeah. sense. Uh, Brian, Daphne, wait a second. I think Daphne was 
Well, are, are we going to let Richard speak or? Yeah, but I want to I want to clear everybody up up here. So when Richard speaks, he's got a happy slate. So okay, I'm well then let, I'll jump in. Then I won't wait. Um, if, if that's okay, Chris. Well, you, I think Daphne's ahead of you. No, I would. You had called on me two ago, and I said call on Richard. I but see. Whatever you I have a very quick comment because it was from Daphne. She'd brought up basically risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And I think that would help, especially the Public Safety uh, Commission. And I think Susan's been working on this. Look at the various challenges that we might face. What is the risk? What's the potential for it happening? You start assigning probabilities and expected values. For example, if this is going to help people outside only and not people inside, then it has a limited value. And you figure out, well, how many people is it actually going to impact? And somebody, I don't remember who, brought up, well, what if it's a day, I think it was Wade, what if it's a day there's lots of people out hiking? Um, okay, but they can see the smoke, Brett brought that up. So I think an analysis of all the disasters that could befall us um, and go into probabilities, risk, potential loss of life, all that kind of stuff could be a very valuable tool for us in, in trying to determine that. I, I mean, my analysis was based on what I've seen living here for many years and it comes down to fire um, and the consequences of fire, um, you know, yeah, we've had some landslides and maybe a rock falls on a car, individual cases, but it's fire. It always comes back to fire. So maybe we could, Susan, how far along are you in that kind of risk analysis? So it already exists within our hazard mitigation plan and to some degree in our emergency operation plan, but both of those are actually the emergency plan right now, we kicked off the update to that and it will have exactly what you said where we go through all the risks and we do a risk assessment analysis on all of that. So we'll be updating that in the coming months. And the hazard mitigation plan, we're, um, we're reviewing RP proposals. We're doing it in conjunction with the Las Virginas Malibu COG. Um, so that process is in motion as we speak. Thank you. Uh, Daphne. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I really appreciated getting input um, from our uh, resident commissioner on, on some of the risks that we're facing and what the likelihood of them. And you know, just listening to everyone's comments over the course of this meeting, the one, I guess, issue that consensus will be needed on is what is the best way to warn people who are outside of a public emergency, right? Because we're all, we're talking about, you know, we all see a plume of smoke and we know what that means, or we have, you know, we're getting at the KBU indoor signals and we have Nixle and we have all these warnings that we as residents and people who've lived here for decades know, know how to use and are aware of. But, you know, we've just built how many new shopping centers in uh, central Malibu and we know how many people show up at Zuma on a sunny day. So we have a lot of people in our town and what is the plan for them and any of us who happen to be outside too, to be notified of an emergency. And, you know, I, I don't, I just feel like we don't have that, the best solution. We don't have the options. We don't have the information to know um, what, what that solution should be as we sit here tonight, but it seems to be that that is the area that we're missing. That's the that's the the, the, the particular risk we're trying to um, address. And um, you know, right now we're looking at these these siren towers. Um, maybe there are other options. Uh, the sheriff's helicopter. Concerned. The sheriff's helicopter with speakers. <laughs> Do ninety percent of. I'm serious. Yeah, no, that is very true. Thank you, Don. And also, the WIA system will be used if we have an emergency and we need to alert visitors to our town. Right. Of course, that won't work if cell service is out of touch, and that's where sheriff helicopters really do do that. It's a real thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ryan. Yeah. So, um, 
I just want to make a couple comments based on what I've heard some of the commissioners say. And having sat, sat through many of these meetings with, with uh, these people, and I'm glad that Richard's here because um, I think he can add some perspective to it. But, um, you know, a couple of things. One, this is not an outdoor only type of warning system. It's really, believe me, it's 10 times louder than a house alarm, a burglar alarm, a car alarm. So people inside are gonna see it. Um, this whole notion of see the smoke, um, the people up corral, when they had their fire, they couldn't see anything because it started at 10, 10 o'clock at night or 11, and it went right through their whole neighborhood during the dark when you're not gonna see any smoke. So there's a couple things to consider regarding that. I'm neither for or against this. I really think that there just needs to be more information on it, but um, it, the, the genesis of it came from the city council saying, hey, we want an early warning. We want a warning system here in Malibu. And it's not just for fire, although fire is probably the primary source. Um, and so again, also these things are on trailers as far as that goes without having permanent ones. The trailers can potentially be um, what we have. And we have a, you know, a, a, a fleet of them parked at city hall or somewhere. Then they also are designed to work when nothing else is working, which I can tell you during Woolsey was part of the problem that the firemen were, were using these GPS systems based on cell services and they had no idea where they were going or what they were doing because it was all down, you know? Um, so the, that's the, this is really a system that's built to be um, uh, something that works without the usual phone, cell service, electrical power. I was here during the Northridge earthquake. The power went out right away in the middle of the night. Um, you know, so if that, and again, whatever the risk assessment is, that's for someone else to decide. Again, this really is just something that we're, uh, the city council wanted to get uh, some information out there and figure out what could be done related to these systems. And this was the system that the public works brought to the task force. And then the task force came up with these four different options that we're really talking about today. But it's not an outdoor only uh, type of warning system. It, you're going to hear it inside your house. I am, and Tom can speak to that if you'd like, but uh, it's not just an outdoor only. So I, I wouldn't be so quickly to poo poo it. I think there needs to be more uh, information. And if we can just do some tests around town with one. I had advocated for one, but the task force voted and decided that it would be better to do six or seven of them so that they could maybe communicate with each other. Um, and due to the topography of Malibu, it's very difficult for them all to communicate with each other. So you kind of have to have one in Malibu West, one at Point Doom, and then down Big Rock, Surf Ride, or, wherever, or Bluffs Park, it sort of needs to go that way because Remember, this is all from a central command somewhere. It's not just somebody at the trailer. It'll be somebody at City Hall or somewhere else that pushes a button and, and decides what kind of an alert we're going to get. So, um, again, it just comes out of a genesis of trying to get an early warning system or a warning system, period, when all other systems are down. So that's where this comes from. Um, and maybe, Tom, you, after I finish, you can tell them about, you know, how loud this truly is and what the expectation is of hearing it inside a house in the middle of the night. Go ahead, Tom. Um, uh, so, so, so the system, you know, if you if you're close to one of the sirens, you, you'll hear it inside. But but it is it is more designed for um, outdoor alert, like for 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 a, a intelligible voice. Um, you'll you'll hear it outside, but you probably won't hear that inside. Um, you may hear the tone. So typically. Um, the, the signal will be 10 decibels lower inside than it is outside. So if you're within that 80 dB range, you'll probably hear it at 70 dB in the house. Um, but if you're, if you're outside of the, if you're in the 70 dB range, it might be lower than that. Um, if that makes sense. Um, some people will hear it inside, but it's, it's um, not designed to be a guarantee that you'll hear it inside. Um, if that makes but, sense. But the map, but the maps that you were showing us during the task force showed these wide ranges of three plus miles or more of of ability to hear these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah they'll, they'll, you'll, you should be able to. But if when you're inside, you'll, it'll be about ten decibels lower than what's on the map um, for inside. Uh, the map, the map um, is modeled for the outside. Daphne, is your hand still up, or were you? 
Okay, and and Joe, I'm going to take your question last or your statements last, and then I want to I want to switch to Richard so we can all hear from him. Yeah, I just had a question to Rob. Is this all from a grant from FEMA that's paying for this for only a siren system, or will it cover other things? Great question, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was like I'm like Ooh. so. Um, and I know Nadia is going crazy too, but but yes, this is from a FEMA grant that we got from after the Wizzle Fire is a FEMA hazard mitigation grant. Uh, um, just to let the kind of the commission know, and, and the reason why we're bringing this up too is that we're kind of we're, we're at a point where we need kind of direction on what we're doing with these sirens because uh, the grant has some very um, um, has has a lot of timelines and milestones that we have to meet. We're at a point to where we're in the time we're in we're, we're ending or getting close to kind of being behind schedule on some of these milestones. We can ask for an extension, kind of and move forward with that. But it's like I I need this information on what the commission intends that want to do with the with the um uh, with the grant. So. So yes, it is. And, and can we can we use it for other purposes? Like for like for what? For similar similar things, notification systems? Yeah, but I mean like through the cell phone or through the radio. So the grant is specifically for sirens, but that's something we can look into and ask our grant manager to see if if we can do that. That's a possibility. Um, I, I, I was already thinking the same thing, kind of thinking that if that's a, if that's a possibility, if, if the commissions are leaning towards one way or the other, if they're thinking, all right, maybe we want to get more information on the, the FM radio alert system, we can check with them and kind of see. Um, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll be asked for an extension for, for the grant. And let me just add that this is a regular annual grant cycle for this grant. And right now we have noticed that the next cycle is starting and the notice of interest is due in a month. So if we wanted to ask for another grant for a different kind of project, now would be the time. Does the existing grant cover this trial? Is it eight position trial or is it not covered? Yeah, it, it would it, it would cover this. Um, if there was a change in scope or something else that we would request, we would put that request into the to the to the grant manager and, and seeing if that could be changed. Uh, um, it, you know, being with being on grants on several times and projects that are funded by grants, it, it, it happens a lot. You go down the road where you think of something and then you, you change you change a little bit of the project and you still meet the overall intent of the the grant. Um, and usually you can get things kind of modified and done that. But just as, as Susan said, doesn't preclude, preclude us from actually submitting another grant and, and moving forward with that. Yeah. Does, does Zuma Beach have a generator or something where a permanent siren can be put on one of the walls there or something because they have power? I, I, I don't know if they do. I think if, if anything, the um, they do. Our station the probably, probably would have something there. Yeah, and I want to add, I think beaches and harbors, they're planning on installing sirens at their beaches. I don't know if the plans include beaches in Malibu, but I know that's a project they're working on. Who is? Beaches and harbors. Fair enough. Um, Richard, how are you? Would you like to give us your, um, your thoughts on the subject of... Uh, the sirens versus radios versus whatever other systems are out there. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I was late. I apologize. I just found out a few minutes ago, thanks to Susan. Um, a couple things. One, one of the things it really boils down to me about uh, regarding the siren system, we don't know at this point if it's effective, how effective it's going to be, or if it's not going to work at all, especially during a high wind event. Um, the only way we're going to find something like that, that out is to do real world testing. I know from the radio world, modeling only goes so far. Once you get down to the granularity of individual trees, buildings, canyons, whatever, um, everything kind of goes out the window to a degree. So from a due diligence standpoint, 
the steering committee generally felt that we need to do something. We can't say, hey, we're taking it on ourselves to say this isn't going to work. We don't think it's feasible because we have no real world data for our area. So what our what initial, as uh, Brian had said, one of our initial ideas was to just do a pilot program with one uh, of these siren, portable sirens in somewhere like Big Rock so we could find out if it would work. That would be the minimal cost uh, and minimal effort route. Uh, in one of our last meetings, it was brought up that, well, maybe we should do five or six different ones in different areas simultaneously. I think both options are still on the table. If that was a concern, the complexity and the cost of it, we could always scale it down to one or two. But again, since this was voted on, if something happens um, in the future, the people will always say, well, what about the sirens? Didn't we even try it? It, it, the, the council voted on it. Why didn't we make an attempt? Why didn't we try something? And so I think that we should do something even if it is a small scale test. So that's the, the background thing. And again, like I said, we have no idea how well it's gonna work, how effective it's gonna be until we get something on the ground. Um, to go to what Brian and I think Daphne had said and, and Scott also about hikers. Yeah, we're all very used to seeing smoke and immediately thinking something was going on back in 83. I remember driving past the Pangans, seeing smoke somewhere, and I turned around and headed home. Um, hikers, people that are not familiar with the area, don't know that. They don't know what that means. Because of all our ridgelines, you can't see necessarily uh, smoke that's starting where it may be something that is, could be coming your way based on predictions of uh, existing or current winds. Um, and people out of the area, all the visitors we have, if you, as you folks have said, would have no idea that. So sirens might be a confirmation that, hey, there's something going on, even if they don't have a voice, even if they don't know necessarily to turn to cable or any other source, it's a signal, you know what, get back to your car, get off the trail, there's something happening where people, especially from out of the area, may have no clue about that. Um, the, one of the other big issues is redundancy. As we all know, yeah, black hole out here during Woolsey. Um, cell phones go down, radio systems can go down, anything can go down. So any measure of redundancy is a good thing. I'm, as Brian said, I'm not for or against the sirens. I just want something that's going to work. And the more systems that we have, the more chances we have that something is, there's gonna be at least one system that is not failure proof, but didn't fail when the others did. Um, hey, I have a question for you, uh, Tom. When you say, when you said it's about 10 dB, less inside. If yeah. you're using 60 and, and 70 dB references, can you give us a good example of what either of those would be? Unmute, if you can. You're muted, Tom. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, 60 dB is basically a speaking voice, like a normal speaking voice. Um, 70, um, 70, 75 is kind of like, um, you know, uh, a busy traffic. Um, like on a highway. So, um, you know, some, something like that. Um, so you want, you want to get, you know, higher than that, obviously, um, if that helps. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, Rob, a quick question. When you were talking about the grant, does the grant funding also apply to renting these systems for a pilot program or is only purchasing? Yeah, it, it's, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem of, of doing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's basically, um, how I see it. Um, again, we don't know if there's if they're going to work. There are going to be some specific problems with some of the proposed locations. Um, one of the earlier ones, I don't know if it's still on the map here. Uh, yeah, it's over by the headlands on Point Doom. Probably, you know, some people may see it as an eyesore. I don't know. So there's possibly going to be, as we've discussed on the steering committee, some blowback from residents and others in some of the areas. But then this is a, a public safety designed system, and you do have to make some you know, concessions for that. That's about it, my opinion right there in a nutshell, Chris. Richard, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Micah? Unmute. Yeah, there we go. Uh, really quick, I just had a question. I mean, I also like Wade waffle back and forth depending on, you know, how this has gone. I, I do at the moment feel like why not? Why not try it, at least in the pub, you know, on the beaches and things like that. Um, but regarding the public program, the pilot program, do you need a permit for this? And are we going to, you know, if we approved one, are we going to get hung up in a permit process or can we do a trial without a permit? 
because I do think that trying it's going to raise a whole nother, you know, load of questions. I can speak to that if you would like. Um, this would require a temporary use permit that we would apply um, for through the planning department. Each testing location would require its own uh, permit application. The temporary use permit would a, allow for a two week trial period. And after two weeks, if you decided that we need more time, we could extend that permit with the planning department. But that is the only permit that would be required for this pilot phase. You know, it would be great if we could time it so that we can try and go to Santa Ana, wouldn't it? We book it for the month in October. Yeah, or November. Yeah, and that way at least all the tourists are out of town. And, you know, even if we notify the public, the tourists have no way of knowing that this is a test. You know, they hear sirens and they're like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> so, um, they can, you know, if we do a pilot September, October, November in there during Santa Ana season, that's just me, though. Scott? Yeah, I'd like to put a motion out to uh, go forward with the pilot program and uh, on a minimal cost basis um, that might entail us uh, getting one trailer and moving it around during the day. Um, and I would like to see in this a pilot program uh, either do it during a Santa Ana, which of course won't be until October, um, or adjust the volume to account for the Santa Ana if that can be done. And maybe Tom, when I finish, you can answer that question. But let's let's go ahead and and vote to uh, do uh, the minimal pilot program that we can try. Um, yep, that's my motion. I'll second uh, it. Who seconded it, Wade? I second it. I'll second that. All right. Um, discussion? Chris, I have a question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Joe's Joe's hand is up. I think it's I been up. Oh, go ahead, while. Joe. I just wanted to know if, if we could get one at the Public Safety Expo on June 10th, if it's too soon or if, it, if one can. Ooh, good idea. Good idea. I would have. I would have to ask uh, my boss. I I don't know um, how quickly we can get one out. I know we have some on order, uh, but but June tenth is what uh, five weeks away. Um, I'd have I'd have to get some confirmation on that. I can't I can't make any promises, but um, you know I'll definitely ask about that and and um, and, and get back to uh, my contact. Good question. Don? Thanks, Joe. Uh, Great idea. Quick question, uh, Tom. You're, the plan you proposed involves doing just that, right? One trailer at eight different yeah, sites? You, all you need is one. You, you can two do four one, days. One, yeah, all you need is one. Yep. And you said two to four days. That, that might not be feasible if we do try to wait for some wind. We might need a little, maybe two mm -hmm. weeks or so. It, the, the the deployment takes about you know 20 minutes or so so you could feasibly do all eight in one day if you really wanted to um yeah. so that, that is feasible but Don, I again think we would need the tups and the t the tups right. take you know they can they can they're they're relatively si relatively simple uh to get but they do take you know they could they can take two weeks to get and so i believe rob well, aren't they good for 10 days one tup Two weeks. two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. That, okay. But that, that's not the, that's the, 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 that's not the issue. Right? That, that wasn't what I was talking about. I was talking about the actual trial it might take, you might want to take two weeks, full two weeks and, and not do it all in one day or two days. But that, somebody's got to plan this out and think it through. That probably isn't us. <laughs> Rob, that'd probably be No you. offense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Daphne, you have your hand up? It's Susan. Um, Susan yes. uh, I just want some clarification, <laughs> some clarification to the motion. Um, first, I would respectfully request that we don't reference the cost. Um, this is going forward on a grant basis, and this commission doesn't have control over city budget. So I think it's just sufficient to uh, move to have a pilot program approved. Um, and the second, I guess, point of clarification 
when Scott, you reference minimal work, um, you know, someone has to determine what the pilot will consist of. And are we going to leave that to the discretion of the public works to um, safe public works department to work with Tom's company? Or are you trying to delineate exactly what the scope of the a pilot supposed to be? No, I leave it to a uh, public works department. And uh, when I should, I should write, I should rephrase the uh, minimal cost. Uh, co I should rephrase that to say cost with fits within our grant. I'm not, Susan, can we put anything regarding cost? I don't, what do you think? I don't think it's necessary. I okay, think so I'll, I'll take that out then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> So anybody... I, would, I would I would request that with the, that the motion be um, that the that we approve for a pilot program to be determined by the public safety department. Yeah, I'm fine with that, Daphne. Okay, so if you, I just want to if you want to rework it. Sorry, just. Go ahead and yeah, make your motion again. Really, yeah. Okay, Mary, rework it as Daphne said that I I'll, I'll move that we initiate the uh, pilot program uh, details to be left to uh, the public works department, not me. You're, if I may, your recommendation. You're you're being asked to make a recommendation to council, correct, Rob? Yeah. So it, it's. So you don't have to worry about cost. You don't have oh. to worry about the details. You just would, if you want to recommend that there be a pilot program, you leave the details okay. to the people that are Fair responsible enough. for that. So what I what I have down is that your uh, the Sir Dietrich moved and Commissioner Major, I believe it was, seconded a motion to recommend to the city council that it authorize a trial program of the siren system with one mobile trailer to be moved to various locations and that it be conducted during Santa Ana conditions if possible. Yeah, well, I, I was asking Scott to clarify that we're not, we're not posing the conditions on how many trailers they're using. Um, okay, yeah, uh, because it, it depends on what fits within our grant, but um, here's something that we should discuss. If we wait for Santa Ana, we're not going to get anything done until mid-October, typically. Tom? Well, you, if you want that removed, then I, we just well, need to okay. rewrite yours. No, I didn't put that in the motion. Um, you did. I, but, um, Tom, can, how would you adjust, if we tried the system on a non-Santa Ana day, how could you adjust the volume to try to mimic the wind blowing strong 30 miles an hour on a Santa Ana day into the face of the siren? Or is that the right analysis? Maybe it doesn't, maybe it's uphill. I mean, we we could um, lower the volume on, on certain speakers uh, that you can, you can tap them, uh, but that we'd have to kind of look into what would what would constitute, you know, um, mimicking that. But, you know, there's there's something we could possibly you know, do to, to mimic that on, on like one side or something like that. Um, Rob? Yeah, so I, I, I want to just echo what uh, what Richard Garvey had mentioned too, is like, there's nothing better than trying it in, in the field in those conditions. And, and so, yeah, you can try to simulate stuff in the speakers that kind of do that, but until you do it during those events, you won't know. Uh, oh, okay. so. So it could work, but right. until you do it, it's so I, I kind of, I 100% agree with Richard. You, you got to, your models are one thing kind of a thing, but you got to get, you got to validate it somehow. And, and whatever model you do, um, especially in engineering, you go like, okay, this is my model. But you got to have some type of validation. You got to have some type of condition that you know that can, that you can, that you can get it calibrated based on what your assumptions are. So that's kind of. Okay. So Mary, Mary, going back, um, so it would still, the motion still would include that to have it operate during a Santa Ana wind, if possible. So, so are what we, if are you we, just are, say on a windy day? Mary, can we, you read, can, can you read it back? To be honest, I have no idea what's left. It's, it's been 
discussed and changed so many times. Well, what I had was to recommend to the city council that it authorize a trial program of the siren system. And are we taking out the reference to the one mobile trailer moved to various yeah, locations? Take, take that out because uh, we'll let public works decide that. Good. And and that we try it on a Santa and I want to try it on I, Santa Ana. And I think Rob is totally right. We uh, won't you know, know if we try it otherwise. Scott, I, I completely agree that that would be the ideal. But I think the specifics of this should be left up to the public works department. They know what we're trying to accomplish and they want to accomplish the same thing. But if we make the recommendation, if we make it too tight, we, you know, we might not get anything. So you know, honestly, I think Rob and them, I think we're all on the same page and we want to test it. And absolutely testing it on a, hey, if I got to go out and help, I'd be glad to. And I'm sure all of us would be. So, but I think we've got to kind of leave that up to them. Is there a problem with design alternative one pilot phase, which was one of our four choices in the staff report? I think that's what we're Daphne. That's kind of basically what we're, what we're working on right now. It's a variation of, of, of uh, number one. Okay, so are we, are we objecting to design alternative one? No. Well, did the design it. alternative one have eight trailers set? It was specific. It was never eight trailers. There was always one eight trailer. trailers. It had temporary <laughs> deployable poles with four speakers. Yeah, but it was always Minus one trailer. Feet. It was always Excuse one Excuse me, can, can, I, can I ask, um, we have a, a motion and a second on the table. Can it either be withdrawn until you finish your discussion or vote on it as is and then oh. move on from there? All right. Let me withdraw it and restate it. And if Wade agrees. It's, isn't it basically pilot one, Scott? I think uh, it is pilot one. As, as Tom described it, though, it's, it, it, he described it as being with one trailer. So we're, yeah. we're, we're oh. there. I, you know, I, I, let me just kind of just uh, you're, you're, you're trying to get into semantics if it's going to be one trailer or not kind of a thing. I, I, I kind of just make a recommendation that kind of leave that up to us to kind of figure out the logistics if it's one trailer or, or two trailers or 15 trailers. And let us kind of figure all that kind of stuff out. Uh, we'll, I, I think we'll, I like what Daphne was going is like it's it says on there uh, design alternative one pilot phase kind of a thing. It, it, if that's all written there. Everything you guys talked about is like there. And, and knowing that it, it is design or alternative one pilot phase with, you know, I, I say in the staff report with the um, objective of doing it during Santa Ana's as much as possible. Will the grant cover any of those scenarios? No, I, I don't. It, I, that's, don't worry about that. I, I I will have that covered kind of a thing. If it's an issue, then I'll bring it up. I, 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 if it was an issue, I, I would say we can do it. But don't I, that shouldn't hold you back on what you're kind of doing. So make it rec if that's the recommendation. Then all right. So I'll is. withdraw the initial motion if Wade agrees and yeah. move to accept uh, option one. There move to recommend option one because we're recommending it. To council, that's the design alternative one, Scott. Design alternative one, yeah. Yeah, I'll second. Right. All right. Okay. So it's uh, authorized option one with, and you want to add on to be conducted during Santa Ana conditions, if possible. Do you want to just add that clarification? Or well, you, option you that to? design alternative one does say that. So it I does. Okay, I don't have that in front of me. So yes, it allows for a different environmental condition. So yep. if we just yep. recommend the adoption yep. of design alternative one pilot yeah. phase, we're all, I think, covered. I, I think we're good. On that. If, call a question. If nobody objects, okay. I'll for the. All right. So we have a, a motion and a second to recommend to the city council that it authorize design alternative one. Oh, Richard wanted to say something, but somebody called the question. Maybe it was Don. No, no. Well, you can decide not to call the question if you want. Well, to. you're actually at a voting phase now, so. Okay, so 
Is there any further discussion? Richard? Yeah, um, I, I just want to say it's very, yes, we all know it's very important to do this test during Santa Ana conditions, but it's also, I've done a lot of product and various equipment testing. It's also very important to get a blue sky baseline test. Mm -hmm. So you really can't only experience how something's going to work under the worst possible conditions. You don't know what the system's like. So ideally, in my opinion, it would be to it would be good to do some type of test that is great conditions, no wind, then you know what the optimum system can do, not only what the worst case is. So it, in my opinion, I would leave the uh, conditions as it's stated in there and not spe specify uh, uh, Santa Ana's or anything. Right, it says over a couple of days in different yeah. environmental conditions. I think that's what we, um, yeah, we decided on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the question. Okay. Commissioner Dietrich? Yes. Commissioner Major? Yes. Vice Chair Drummond? Yes. Commissioner Belsberg? Yes. Commissioner McClay? Yes. Commissioner Anit? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Merrick? Yes. Vice Chair Spiegel? Yes. Chair Frost? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. It's a successful meeting when 10 commissioners <laughs> all agree on the same thing. I, I'm <laughs> proud to be a part of that one. We all should be. Good thank to you. you. It's a tribute to you, Chris. Yeah, it's a tribute <laughs> to all of you. Motion um, to adjourn. That, yeah. that brings us to the end. Somebody would like to make a motion to adjourn? You don't need a motion, Chris. Yes, we, we do actually need a meeting. Oh, we do. It's a special yes, meeting. You should, right. Especially with a meeting. Well, we should always, but yes, please have a motion. I'll make so a motion nice to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Who seconded it? I did, Scott and Josh. Yeah, I, was that Josh? I thought. Okay, I think thank so. you. Good. Uh, Commissioner Spiegel? Yes. Chair Spiegel, excuse me. Commissioner uh, Chair Dietrich? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Major? Yes. Commissioner McClellan? Yes. Vice Chair Drummond? Yes. Chair Frost? Yes. Commissioner Anit? Yes. And thank you, Tom. And Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. And Commissioner Mary? Yes. <laughs>